Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 and the following come to me all of you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light uh, also Titus chapter 2 and verse I think it's verse 11 Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that I'm going to pause on that and let's open Genesis chapter 1 and I'm going to tie all of that up in just a minute. Genesis chapter 1. Uh, excuse me Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Thus the heavens and earth and all the hosts of them were finished and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it saying uh, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. We read in Matthew 11 that Jesus says come to me I'll give you rest. Learn from me you'll find rest. In Titus chapter 2 verse 11 it says that the grace of God gives us salvation and then verse 12 it says and not only it gives us salvation it also teaches us. So grace is not only something that we receive it's also something that teaches us, something that we learn. And in Genesis when God created man in chapter 1 last few verses the Bible says that on the sixth day God made Adam and he made Eve on the sixth day and on the seventh day God rested. God rested from his works six days of creation. Now God did not rest because he was tired. He rested from his work. He never gets tired yet he rested from his work. He earned his rest but watch this Adam and Eve entered God's rest without earning it because they didn't work for six days they were just created they entered into the rest that God earned because the first day of Adam and Eve was God's last day of creation Adam and Eve entered on the first day of their existence on earth into rest their first day wasn't work their first day was a day of rest it was God's last day of work that tells me we were created by God to live out of rest. We were created by our Creator to live out of a place of rest. If you're taking notes, I will have two points for you today. The first one is the rest. Rest is a person. Grace of God is a person. Rest is a person. This person whose name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the person who gives us rest. The same way as we see in here that God creates something for six days and then on the seventh day he rests. Adam enters into that rest. Jesus he creates salvation for us by paying a heavy price and he says it is finished and then we enter into that rest into his finished work which is salvation. Rest for us is not a day during the week. Rest for us is a person in whom we enter and in him we find a rest. Rest from trying to please God with our works. Rest from the grip of sin. Rest from the heaviness of our burdens. The, the weight of uh, legalism. That rest is found in Jesus. Jesus doesn't invite us to a religion. He says come to me all of you who are laboring and those who are heavy laden. He doesn't say come to a set of beliefs, come to a school, come to a church service. He himself becomes that rest. He himself becomes that source of our salvation. Rest is found in Jesus. Rest is found in grace. Rest is found in salvation. It's interesting because we live in the most restless, depressed, full of anxiety, full of weariness and tiredness generation. We probably have best medicine that any other generation had. The psychiatrists, the counselors are on the rise. Before people didn't go to a con today almost every person has a therapist, a counselor, a psychiatrist. Many of you in here today 
people in the world today. It's, it's a popular, it's, in fact, it's actually a cool thing now to go to a therapist. You see this on the late night shows, people talking about how they're all seeing a therapist. Because we live in a generation that is desperate, hungry, and in need of rest. We were created by God to live out of rest. But the foundation of our rest is salvation. Without a proper relationship with God, which is based not on me earning it, but my me entering it without a proper foundation of salvation without the proper foundation of our relationship with God what begins to happen is we live restless lives we live lives where we are not at rest rest is found when you enter it not when you earn it you don't earn God's salvation and relationship with God any more than Adam did not earn a day of Sabbath. God earned a day of Sabbath. Adam just entered it. Adam entered what God earned and that's what salvation is. We enter into what Jesus earned on the cross. Jesus earned rest. We simply enter it. That's why in Hebrews chapter 10 it says therefore for the children of God there's still a rest to be entered. It never says rest to be earned. See my friend when you reduce your salvation as something you earn you'll never find rest. You will toil and you will work hard and Jesus invites people who are toiling in labor of legalism in the burden of sin. He says come to me he doesn't say come and earn it. He says come and enter in that rest. When you find salvation, you find rest. Isn't that interesting almost every testimony we hear? What is the first and most important thing everybody says about their testimony when they find Christ? I found peace. I found sense of rest. And if you look at their life, you will see in most of their cases, their finances didn't change. Their family hasn't come to the Lord yet. They're, they didn't necessarily get healed. What changed is this. Something changed in their relationship with God, which quickly released a sense of rest they lacked before. Could it be that the core of restlessness, the root of restlessness, is the fact we don't live out of what Jesus did. We're still trying to do something. And you may say, but I'm not a religious person. I don't earn it trying to earn salvation. Still, without the grace of God as the foundation of your relationship with God, there will always be a restlessness. No therapist, no sleeping medicine, no psychiatrist will be able to diagnose and treat. Counseling is good. Therapy is very good. Uh, medicine is also good. It has its place. But the root of human restlessness has been the fact that man stopped living out of grace of God. Instead, they grind with their works to please God. Jesus is the grace and grace is rest. I don't earn it, I enter it. I don't deserve it, I receive it. Come and I will give you. He didn't say come. And work for it. Come and I will give you rest for your soul. As Christians it's what we experience when we come to Christ. We experience rest. It's our foundation. The foundation of our relationship with God. It gives a sense of rest. It's a beautiful thing to know that your sins have been paid for. We went to a vacation uh, to Puerto Rico a few weeks ago. Well we were invited to a vacation to Puerto Rico by dear friends of us who, ours, who paid for the vacation. It's very hard to say no to a vacation that's paid for. <laughs> when Christ invites you into rest, He invites you into His vacation, which He paid for. So when we entered into that vacation, uh, the only thing difference is that it's not an all-inclusive Cancun. So Puerto Rico is a little bit different. Well, at least the one that, that my friends booked, it's a very, very nice hotel. I probably wouldn't be able to afford it or think of affording because it was expensive. But because they paid for it, I gladly entered into it. <laughs> the only problem was that is when we were eating there, we had to pay for the food. 
You know how it works is you put it on the room and then at the end when you finish you, 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 you pay for the room and so the meals are very expensive. Like breakfast is $60, uh, $100 dinners and so that's the only thing they had available. It wasn't like that we were just high in, high in the sky. It's just that's the only thing they had available. And so we were eating and I'm not going to lie to you. I was looking at the prices and had restlessness. I was happy with the fact that we were staying there for free. I was like man praise God. This is grace of God. And then when I was eating it you know, I didn't want to pretend like, no, I'm going to skip, I'm going to fast, you know, because it didn't want to look, you know, bad in front of my friends. But I'm like, you know, we'll, we'll put it on the credit card. And so we, we were eating and it was enjoyable, a delicious food, amazing food, great service, just, just, a, just an amazing thing. And then in the beginning of our vacation there, our hosts, our friends, they said, we are paying for the food. And I felt guilty. I said, you already paid for the hotel. You, you, you can't just, we'll take care of the food. We, we got it. Because see, I knew that what comes free for me doesn't come free for someone else unless it's worthless. The only thing that costs somebody and it costs you nothing is something of value. See, the only reason why the entering of the rest, it will be no rest if somebody didn't have to earn it. It just happens not to be you who earned it. The Lord worked for six days and Adam is invited into the rest that God worked for. Jesus invites me into the rest that he paid for. And so we ate and right on the last day, you know, I go in to return my keys and I pull out my credit card to pay for, um, for all the meals that we had there, all other activities that we did over there. And, and then I hear this news. Um, oh, it's paid for. It's a happy feeling. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. You just a sense of <sighs> I'll raise hallelujah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. When you live with the notion that God invites you into his rest. That he paid for. He lets you live out the rest that he continues to pay for. What it does, what it does it do to you? A sense of relief and rest. My friend, every other rest, whether it's sleeping, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, practical rest that we get, nothing comes close to the rest you get in your soul from living with the reality that you get a chance to enter into something he earned. Eat freely of something he paid for to invite you in and now that you're in it he doesn't ask you to pick up the tab. God says I'll take care of it and while you get it for free please understand it didn't cost them nothing because it cost you nothing and that is why we live with a sense of gratitude. We live with a sense of thankfulness. We, we look to our Savior you know I look at those friends right now with the very different, I feel like I own them something. I feel a sense of I, I, gratitude, yes, but there's more than that. I feel like I'll do anything. That's exactly when you experience God's grace, it'll never give you a license to sin. When you genuinely experience God's rest, you will not seek to live life by the law, but live life by love. Life by the law is the Old Testament. In the New Testament when we live in God's grace, we live in God's rest, people sometimes say well it's simply we're doing nothing. No, no, no my friend. When we're living out of God's rest, we are responding back to that rest by living out of love and love is above the law. Not in the sense you know when sometimes people reject and break the law and act selflessly and corrupt we say well you're acting above the law. Not in that sense but in the sense that the law says don't kill somebody and love says I will love my enemy. Love is always above that. Why is that? Because when I enter into God's rest I enter in what he earned. Something happens my heart like our brother shared today, he says, God gave me, took the heart of stone. God gives me a new heart, which is right away filled with the power, not to fulfill the law, but to fulfill the heart of God, which is to love him 
and to love other people. I will go beyond what the law required, not because I have to, it's because I have the power and I have the inner motivation, which is called the grace of God. The grace is rest and rest is a person. This rest happens because I enter in what God earned. This grace happens because I enter into the finished work of the cross. Jesus says, come to me. I will give you rest. It's all paid for. Come and just receive it as a gift. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2 verse 11, it says the grace of God has appeared to all men giving us salvation. Adam enters into the rest and this shows God's original design. God always created a man to live out of his rest. Not to live for rest but out of rest. Point number one, rest is a person. Point number two is rest is a principle. Rest is a principle. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, I'm sorry verse 5 it says this there's this phrase in Genesis it says so the evening and the morning were the first day verse 13 so the evening and the morning were the third day verse 19 so the evening and the morning were the fourth day verse 23 so the evening and the morning were the fifth day <laughs> verse 31 so the evening and the morning were the sixth day so not only God creates one day out of which we should rest and makes that a commandment and that's symbolic to us of the grace of God because Adam was created to enter into that rest and when God gives us salvation we enter into the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that's really what grace is about living out of what Jesus did on the cross in other words you start where Jesus finished the starting point of a believer is the finished work of the cross pretty much Jesus worked he reached the ceiling and he says you begin your floor is my ceiling you start what I finished. It's so incredible, so amazing. You enter into my rest. God says, I worked, you start here. But I didn't work God. God says, that's the point of grace. You start what I finished and you live out of the, that rest. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Somebody say, amazing grace. But see, not only God creates a Sabbath, which is to rest, but in here we see that God starts each day with evening and the morning. God did not begin a day with the morning. He begins a day with the evening. Now what do you do in the evening? You go to sleep. Now some of us, what do you do in the evening? You start your day. But the normal people <laughs> who grew up in functional homes. <laughs> Just kidding. Normal people typically in the evening is when you either have a meal and then you get ready to go and sleep. In fact, if you've ever been to Israel or you've been in a Jewish home, you find out that the Shabbat, which is the day of rest, does not begin on Saturday morning with breakfast. It begins on Friday night with dinner. So Jewish people live by this principle in the Old Testament that the day does not begin with the morning. It begins with good night's sleep. In other words, God is saying, not only I am creating you to live out of rest, I want you to live your life every day starting with rest. So grace is not just a person of Jesus, grace is also a principle of life which we can embrace every day. No wonder Jesus says, come to me all of you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And then verse 29 of chapter 11, he says, learn from me. For I am meek and gentle in heart and you will find rest. So rest is not just a person that I enter, rest is a principle I learn. No wonder in Titus 2 11 it says grace appeared to all men giving us salvation and verse 12 it says teaching us. So grace is not just salvation when I enter into God's rest and I live out of what Jesus finished. Grace is also bringing sanctification where I live out the grace of God every day. I live out of that rest. Now I'm going to share with you practically how to do that. See the problem with many of us is this, is we enter into God's rest but we live grinding. We start with grace but we continue with the grind. It's like this, is I went to my vacation with my friends, they paid for the hotel but I paid for the food. Even though they promised in the beginning when I entered into the hotel they said, we got your food covered but I felt guilty. It's, it, it's wrong. 
You know, I need to contribute something. And so what, what I started to do is I looked for different ways. I'm like, I'm gonna go in and try to pay it before they do. But my Russian friends, they're, they're very, very good, very sneaky. So the <laughs> night before that they went in and stepped in and, and took care of my legalism, self-righteousness. <laughs> they covered that and to God be the glory. I'll raise a hallelujah. Come on. Thank you, Golosinski. The same thing is with the grace. So grace is not just something I enter into the hotel. God says that I want you to live every day out of it. Out of that grace. So I'm going to share with you in the conclusion of this message, five differences between living daily in the grace or living daily in the grind. They're going to be very practical. Number one is begin your day with good night's sleep. God created your body to start with good night's sleep, not with caffeine. God created your body in such a way where He wants you to understand your day does not begin with coffee, your day begins with a good night's sleep. People who are sleep deprived for a very long time abuse the God's creation, their body. If you constantly deprive yourself from sleep constantly, you are abusing God's creation, which is the temple, the body. There is no spirituality in deprivedness of sleep. Now I understand sometimes you're doing your exam, you're, you're doing your test and for a season or maybe you're finishing, excuse me, a project and you really need to give in more time. That's understandable. But I'm talking about if you develop the habit, perhaps an addiction to sleep less, to sleep very little and you call that being disciplined my friend that is being disresponsible and unresponsible to the creation of God. God starts your day with a sleep not with coffee and you should as well. Your day does not begin when you wake up your day begins when you go to sleep. God created each day to start with sleep not with work. Amen. If you don't rest from fatigue you will get arrested by failure. Many moral failures are a result of not being rested. If you look at even the pastors who morally fail, you will see many times two things that follow before moral failure. Pride and tiredness. When you become so exhausted, become so tired, next thing that happens is you will fail. You will get arrested by failure. You will get arrested by your faults. And in order to avoid that, we have to get a good night's sleep. One of the marks of grace, grace values sleep. Grind values caffeine. Red Bull, energy drinks, all other supplements. My friend, God did not create your body to live on red, running empty. God created your body to live on rest. God created your body in such a way that when you go to work, your battery, physical battery is full. Your physical tank is full of rest. People sometimes ask me, uh, you know, what is the secret of, of waking up early to pray? And they think there's a magic pill like discipline. They don't realize and I always tell people the same thing. The secret to waking up early to spend time with God is to go to sleep early. It's a very powerful secret. I heard when I was a teenager, John Bavir shared one thing that stuck with me and he said this, any minute after 10 p.m. you spend awake is the minute you take away from Jesus the next morning. I took that so personally and I started to live by that to the best of my ability. Not every day it happens where I go to sleep before 10. Now I understand this may come as a shock but after 10 typically in my world there will happen a conversations that could have happened before that or movies or TV shows. Things that will happen after 10 p.m. that honestly do not necessarily bring the most fruit or productivity. And next thing that happens is when you come early or you wake up early, you're more alert and your prayer time with the Lord or your morning hours should never come at the expense of being sleep deprived. Otherwise you will not be able to do it consistently, continually or enjoyably. If you're finding a difficult time to wake up early in the morning, can I ask you a question right now? What do you do before you go to sleep? I am pretty sure you're not interceding for the nations. I am pretty sure you're not discipling the, your disciples. 
okay if it's Netflix Hulu or Amazon video or all of those things what would happen if you would start your day with good rest only then you'll be able to actually wake up which is our second point of grace is start your day with God not with work so not only I begin my day with sleep not with caffeine but grace says I start my day with God not start my day with work Jesus says learn from me for I am meek and gentle and you will find rest for your souls one of the difficult things that many of us have is that we start our day with our phone with social media with gym with workout or some of us we start our day right away answering emails right away doing those things our mind gets plugged in and sucked into work work will deplete you worship will replenish you that's why the bible says in isaiah they will walk and not get tired they will run and not get weary and they will soar with wings like eagles but you know what's the secret before that what well, the secret is this those who what work hard and grind no it says those who rise early and give coffee those who what wait upon the lord that means not only I get adequate of adequate amount of sleep but grace means I have to spend first 10 minutes 30 minutes an hour with the Lord not with work if you don't spend time with God at the beginning of your day you are God why because you don't need a God you already have one it's you only people who know there is a God spend time with God others just spend time with themselves because they are God you're telling God I got this that's not good <laughs> idolatry is sin when you spend time with God you acknowledge there is a God and you need him spending time with God wait on God before working that teaches me there's a sense of replenishment that takes place when God becomes first. I understand every person here is a different schedule. Every person has a different responsibility. But please, I challenge you this week. Whatever your excuse is, whatever price you have to pay to reprioritize your life, live by grace. You will not see God's grace in your life if you focus on hustle instead of worship. As the beginning of your day. Can somebody say amen? That's why the Bible says, blessing of the Lord makes rich and it adds no sorrow with it. Watch this. It doesn't say the busyness of work makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. Grace gives you peace in your progress. Grinding removes peace out of the progress. You will make rich but have sorrow with it. There will be tension, there will be stress, there will be overwhelming sense of anxiety that will follow your success. You won't enjoy your success because see only the presence of God fuels peace in your process and in the pace of your life. And that has happened, the blessing of the Lord. There, for many of us who live in the grace, the blessing of the Lord. And when we are out of the grace as Christians, we live in the grind which is the busyness of life it will make you maybe rich but it will add no peace it will it will make you prosperous but it will add no joy and therefore when you spend time with God something begins to happen God infuses your progress with peace and you succeed without failing here you progress without losing your peace and losing your joy you have an inner contentment and satisfaction in your heart I want to encourage you it's to your good to spend time with God spending time with God doesn't take time it saves you time it saves you a lot of time from doing a lot of bad things it it, it recalculates recalibrates your purpose your, your passions it's to your good to spend time with God it's the first sign you live by grace because you're saying Lord I want your oil on my machine I want your oil on my engine. God, I don't want to grind life. I, I don't want to grind through life. I want to grace through life. I want what I do to have a grace upon it. What I touch to have a grace on it. Can somebody say amen? The first principle of living by the grace of God is 
I get a good night's sleep because God created the day to start with evening and then the morning. The second one is I put God first, not work. Now people who don't live in the grace of God, that's fine. You can put work first, social media, you know, other things that are very, very important to you. And that is okay. But please understand, you cannot expect God's grace in what you do if God is not first. This applies to business people. This applies to pastors. This applies to cell leaders, stay-at-home moms. This applies to people who are nurses, doctors, governors in the government, in the media, to every one of us. If you're a believer, take time to spend time with God. And your church happens to have a place here in the morning called morning prayer. You can do that here. You can do that in your closet. You can do that whatever you do, but spend time with God first. Come on now, come on. Number three, what grace does is in grace we live unhurried life. Hurry kills happy. I'm not sure how proper English that is, but it's true. The more hurry you are, less happy you are. I find it interesting that Jesus never ran. Even when the girl was dying, Jesus walked. And walked slow enough that a woman who was hurting was able to touch him. And a crowd that was following him was able to keep up. Another thing that is interesting is Jesus did not use ever a horse that is recorded in the Bible. He used a walking animal. Jesus was never in a hurry. The weight of the world was on his shoulders. He never ran. Jesus lived in the moment. In fact, he got late to some things just because he was never in a hurry. He stayed long enough at the wedding to see them run out of wine. Most of us, we would have left that wedding two hours into it. Because we have important things to do. Like what? I don't know. Something. <laughs> Imagine Jesus had a world to save. He stayed at the wedding for seven days. You know where the first miracle happened? When he lingered. Some of us, the service, the moment I get people up, you're running already. You will not see God move because God's grace does not come on a pace of life where you're constantly speeding. You're constantly running. And I know you may say that you're passionate. My friend, there's a difference between passion and impatience. And many times impatience masquerades as passion. But if you're always in the hurry, never available for anything, always busy, what happens is you're grinding. But there's a very high chance there's no grace in what you're doing. You're active. But not productive. You're like the guy running on the treadmill. You're, you're sweating and still in the same place. That's why I'm against running. I have a verse in the Bible against running. The Bible says the wicked man runs and nobody chases him. Anytime I get on the treadmill that verse is coming into my mind. I was like Vlad you're not a wicked. Stop running. You're not a wicked. Stop running. Now I understand the Bible says we run the race so I know the context. I just live unhurried life. I heard this preacher said one time, people come up to him all the time and they say that, I know you're busy, I know, I know you're busy, but can I, can I talk to you? I know you're busy. And he responded with, with something that really touched me. He said, I'm not busy. He says, yes, I have tons of things to do. He said, I'm not busy. I'm present. He says, with you, I'm here right now. When I leave you, I'm going to talk or do the next thing and I'm going to be present there. He says, I'm not busy. I'm present. And so I would like to ask you church the same thing. Don't come to me and start with, I know you're busy. If you have a question, ask. And if you have a meeting that you want to schedule, why don't you start first with a question and let me determine if we need a meeting. Don't live your life busy. Live your life fruitful. That's why the Bible doesn't say we're spirit driven. It says we're spirit led. Why? Because as Christians, we have a pace. See, grace has a pace. Grace has a pace of life. And many of us, we miss that grace because our pace is in a hurry. Is, is running too fast. I think it was Kerry Boone that said that if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Busyness is not a fruit of the Spirit. Long-suffering patience is. Because patience is long-suffering. To slow down is suffering. <laughs> Can somebody say amen? 
grind is you're driven by life grace is you're led by life Jesus was able to sleep in the storm he was able to be present you drive a car you lead sheep you don't drive your life God will lead your life can somebody say amen and so in order to be with the Holy Spirit we have to be led Holy Spirit doesn't drive us we're not cars we're humans he leads us that's why Psalm 23 it says he leads me in the green pastures he leads me nowhere does it say he beats me and drives me <laughs> and when you are not led by the Lord like that guess what happens you begin to drive your children crazy drive your husband or your wife crazy we drive other people crazy why because when we don't live in a state of rest we project the very restlessness we live in we project it on our employees we project it on our bosses our managers we live out what what, what is functioning in our life and I'm going to be the first one to admit this is the hard for me because I live a life that is that is that is crazy busy and to be able to renew my mind and say, Vlad, don't be busy, be present. That means if you're in Philippines, you're in Philippines. If you're in Pasco, you're in Pasco. If you are on a date with your wife, you're on a date with your wife. If you are preparing a sermon, you're preparing a sermon. If you're checking the Instagram, you're checking the Instagram. Be present in whatever that you are in. And stop living with the lie that you are busy because then there will be no grace in what we do. And we will do a lot and then not accomplish a lot. Because God's grace is not helping us. We are helping us. We're grinding but we don't have grace so if you're talking to somebody talk with that person if you need to go to tell them I'm really uh, I need to go to someone else can I continue that conversation later but be present in whatever situation that you are in what changes our life is the presence of God and the presence of God is God being present can somebody say amen number four is keeping up with Kardashians will keep you out of grace I did not use the keeping up with Jonas's because most of us don't know what that phrase means but the modern generation knows keeping up with Kardashians meaning anytime you live your life competing or comparing yourself to others is the first sign you are no longer living in the grace of God you're grinding there is a verse in Genesis Genesis chapter 33 it's been such a powerful verse for me and reminder verse 12 it says then Esau said let us take our journey let us go I will go before you but Jacob said to him my Lord knows the children are weak and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me and if the man should drive them hard one day all the flock will die please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant oh man this this can free somebody up let somebody go ahead of you let somebody get better than you let somebody do that which you dream to do one day but you just can't why because you got children and flocks and they got an army you can't do it why because you're riding a minivan and they're flying an airplane and there you are trying to fly to keep up with the Jonas's but you were not equipped with the same engine with the same wings you have a different situation but the ego insecurity kicks in and we begin to drive our flocks and children to keep up with Esau's army and therefore we lose the grace because we're driving too fast please my lord go on ahead before his servant I will lead on slowly at a pace which a livestock can go before me and the children that are able to endure until I come to my Lord he's not saying I stop everything I do it just he says I slow down slow enough that the grace can keep up many of us lose the grace because we pick up the speed that's outside of the grace now for those of you who drive by yourself from one place to another you know that you decide your speed not the speed limit you decide your speed depends on how fast you want to get there right and you got you're going yellow yellow means green you go through how many of you know that your driving changes the moment you have 10 people following you when you're leading people let's say to see the Badger Mountain or something to have you you know one thing you have to slow down so that people can keep up see that's exactly how the anytime you have a grace of God goodness and mercy follow you you have to slow down so that you can keep up with the grace if you lose the grace you step into the grinding 
and usually why this is why it's happening is because we're keeping up with Kardashians we're keeping up with the neighbor we're keeping up with the Jonas's we're keeping up with that brother he's already reaching his dream he's already living it they got a house why we don't have a house they got that nice car and why we don't have a nice car you deserve it you earn it hard you're not worse than them they already traveling why are we not traveling they already took their second vacation and we haven't been to one vacation and so what begins to happen is we let other people's speed determine our pace and what that does is it throws us out of the grace of God and we hurt the flocks we hurt our children we hurt our marriages we hurt our health not because we were not equipped it's just not our speed come on somebody come on, no. they say it's lonely on the top it's only for those who were speeding the top is never meant to be lonely the only reason why it's lonely on the top is because you were driving faster than your flocks could keep up and therefore you end up there by yourself your wife left you your kids left you everybody left you. you're living in the mansion alone why because you should have slowed down at the pace of the flock at the pace of your children at the pace of your spouse at the pace of the leadership at the pace of other people and my friend that takes the grace of God grace of God does not speed you have to find the rhythm of that grace slow down if you need to otherwise you lose it and if you go too slow you'll limit the grace if you go too fast you lose it if we go too slow we limit it because some of us we have the other problem we are so slow it's like the children are like come on so slow that we limit the grace of God because the grace doesn't work if you stand you have to move it's just you look at your flock you diagnose it, you, it's your situation you find out am I a fish that's supposed to swim or am I a bird that's supposed to fly am I a moped that drives 40 miles per hour or am I an airplane that drives 500 miles per hour once you know who you are you know your engine you know your gifts you know the promises God has given you you know who you're leading you determine that pace with accordance with the Spirit of God and you you drive as fast as you can keep your family so when you reach the top you have a family to celebrate it with not someone to say why is nobody here celebrating because you went there too fast and somebody say amen are you receiving something and the last thing how to live in that grace is so grind is comparing and grace is content how to live in that grace we said get a good night's sleep the second is start, start your day with God live unhurried life don't keep up with other people keep, let the grace keep up with you and the last one is take a day off physically from work take a day off God created a commandment and this commandment was to take one day off during the week now for most of us of course we don't live under the ten commandments but nevertheless this is a still principle that is very very powerful can i remind you one second please one second i'll, I'll call you guys can i remind you in israel there was four commandments that if you break you get punished by death one of them is rebellion to your parents and i truly believe parents want to bring that back <laughs> second one was adultery when you cheat on your spouse there will be less adulteries if that would have been brought back. The third one is idolatry when you worship other idols. And the last one was for breaking the Sabbath. It's interesting. For breaking a Sabbath, God punished people by death. You might say that's harsh. Do you know that this commandment is still intact? Did you know that God no longer punishes us? Our life does. Overworking is killing us. Breaking tenth, the fourth commandment is killing you. No wonder Seventh-day Adventists live 10 years longer than average people. If you count the math, do the math, you will find every Sabbath they keep is added to their life. Every Sabbath you don't keep is subtracted from your life. Keeping the Sabbath is for our good. The Bible says we are not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for us. God created grace operates like this. You give one day away from work and you stop whatever you do six days. You stop that and you give that to the Lord. You give that to your family and you give that to your soul and you completely disconnect completely and you honor that day and make that day sacred. That day is important and you have to honor that day. 
It's interesting because the fourth commandment comes before all the moral commandments. The Lord started dealing with my heart last year because with me I didn't take a day off. Now I had one day off that I didn't come to church but the church was lived in my house because all, my, all the sermon, sermon preparation I did at the house on Saturday and for about 12 something years I did not have a day off. I can count how many days I actually did not work on the church stuff on one hand in 12 years. I was in one meeting and one pastor started to challenge me. He says, do you keep the Sabbath? And I said, I live in the purpose of God. I did some religious dumb answer that I gave him just so he can leave me alone. And he started to challenge me. He says, the Bible is very clear. He says, if you break this, he says, you will become more susceptible to breaking the rest of the commandments. He says, you can't break, thou shalt not lie, cheat on your spouse and steal until you first break the commandment of honoring the Sabbath. But see, I like everyone, I'm driven. I want to write books. I want to, I want to create things. You know, even on my day off, I still would do exactly the same thing. But I started to study the commandment and I found one, found one very interesting thing. Before the Bible commands us to rest, it commands us to work for six days. And I found that the reason why I'm not able to rest on Saturday and I'm preparing a sermon is because I'm slacking on Monday through, through Friday. In which way? Was I busy on those days? Oh yeah, it's just busy with wrong things. I was busy with a lot of stuff except for me the sermon preparation is my number one job and instead of carving out the time, closing, turning off the phone, disciplining, I didn't do that so I did everything for everybody except the job I'm supposed to do and then I had to give up my day off and I blamed it on the ministry. In reality it was me not being responsible. I couldn't enjoy a day off because I didn't do the work God asked me to do. And God says, I won't let you rest if you don't work. You have to work and then you can rest. And so then I started to take it seriously where I don't prepare for messages on Saturday. Where they're finished by Thursday. I started to develop that discipline. Why? So that on Saturday we can have a day off. And then we switched it even with our staff where now we give our staff Friday and Saturday off. But the work day starts on Sunday since we started the three services. I want to tell you something. There is a power in taking a day off. You see Chick-fil-A for example, they're doing way better with sales than most of the restaurants because I believe God honors when you give your day off. It's like a tithe. You give your tithe, you trust God will bless the rest of the 90%. If you give one day off, God will bless the rest of it. When I grew up in Ukraine, my, my parents, we kept the Sabbath like Pharisees. We were not allowed to use scissors. I remember one time I needed to finish school project. I picked up scissors. My Lord, my parents didn't kill me but they did discipline me. You couldn't turn on a vacuumer. And I was like, man, it's such a religion. And I look back, I'm like, man, we had it so good. <laughs> and now on Sundays, you know, if we need to go finish painting the house, we go finish, finish painting the house. We're like, we have no sacredness to enjoying disconnect from work. In the conclusion of this message, I would like to read to you what Mark Driscoll said about taking a day off. Five, six things that kill our day off. Number one is poor work ethic. If, you're, if you don't do your work during the week, you will end up doing your work on your day off. If you're disorganized, lazy, late, prone to procrastination, your day off will be devoured by a bunch of tasks which should have been done already. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, religious rules. Let the Holy Spirit guide and direct your Sabbath. Religious people want to remove the Holy Spirit and replace Him with their rules. But their rules never work. We are not filled with rules. We are filled with the Holy Spirit who helps us to obey the Word of God. Everyone's day off is going to look a little bit different. If you find something that works for you, you can make a rule for yourself. But don't impose that on others. Because you did not write the Bible. Number three, observing a Sabbath day without observing a Sabbath heart. Sometimes you get a day off, but you're still anxious, stressed, sleepless, and unable to sit down and enjoy it. Your heart is not able to Sabbath. Perhaps your identity is in work. So you're not working. So when you're not working, you lose a sense of value. Or perhaps you need to find a way to take your thoughts captive. He says, I always carry a notebook and if something comes to my mind on my Sabbath day, I write it down so it's out of my head so I can get it later. Number four is a Pharaoh who keeps us away from enjoying our day off. Our Pharaoh today tends to fit into our pocket. One of the great Sabbath killers is a smartphone. 
ever present dominating our whole life interrupting at all hours demanding a constant attention with emails social media articles calls texts and more technology will kill your sabbath if you don't establish some boundaries if your phone does not sabbath your soul will not sabbath that's true right there number five resting from your work instead of resting for your work work is not sinful therefore sin before sin entered the world the Lord took a man and put him in a garden to work and keep it it wasn't until the fall that work became toilsome in some way a fruitful Sabbath must prepare you and energize you for the work God called you to do during the six days and number six stimulants instead of a Sabbath we sabotage our rest when we use stimulants instead of Sabbath. Rather than taking a break, we consume coffee, carbs, candy, energy drinks, and soft drinks all day. Then we go home stressed out, we watch TV, we surf the internet, then go into drinking the alcohol. As a result, the population of full, caffeinated, drunk, clumsy, phone answering, Sabbath violating wrecks, we called it America. Amen. Yeah. you're not busy you're just disobedient I got so much things to do four jobs bills to pay if you don't put God first in your finances by tithing God can release grace and the rest of it the same thing happens with the day off grace instead of grind can somebody say amen hey this is Pastor Vlad and thank you for watching this sermon please click on the subscribe so that you can be a part of our Hungry Generation YouTube community. And click on the bell as well so that you can be notified when we upload the new sermon. Thank you for watching and God bless you.